and the crap. You're in the streets. You're doing your thing. You're hustling. How many kids do you have? Two. How were you when you had your first kids? Were you were you were you in the streets at the time? Yeah, I definitely was. My son, I had him uh, a week shy of my 19th birthday, and my daughter I had when I was 21. Wow. So I'm assuming your support system, your parents played a big role in helping to raise them? Oh, absolutely. Especially when I went to prison. They were, so like my my kids are like my sister and my brother, you know, because they grew up like that because they had my parents who held them down. So Mm -hmm. they had a lot of the same nurturing that I had growing up. However, my parents got smarter at the way that they raised kids after, you know, they made a couple mistakes. You know, after you do things a couple of times, you learn different systems of doing things. So my son was very, very, very sheltered, but it, it was a good kind of sheltering. So my mother helped him uh, tap into his gifts. And then she built a stoosh. My mother's a real estate broker. So in the bottom of her real estate office, she built my son a recording studio. So she got smart. She said, I, this is how I'm going to keep my son, my grandson off the street. I'm going to find what he loves. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry to cut it. Go ahead. I'm going to invest in that. And I'm going to push that. So my kids got a lot of tapping into their gifts and really cultivating that in-house instead of letting them just kind of go out of house and do what they wanted to do, so to speak. Got you. Do do you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I have two older brothers. Okay, good. And and, and I was hoping it would be brothers. Did any of your brothers hit the streets before you? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. My oldest, my older brother, um, he also, I, that's why I idolized. It, mm-hmm. Same like me. Like, we just had this thing. <laughs> just, just crazy. He also kind of went the street route as well. He eventually came back because we both did. And that's the thing about children. Mm-hmm. If you raise your children right, after they make, it's like the, prodig- the prodigal son. After they make enough decisions wrong, they're going to come back because they was taught the right way. That, so that's we, what people don't understand. It's, it's biblical. You know, the Bible says train up a child. And, and, and you know, the, if you train up a child in a way that they should go, they'll make their mistakes. But they will eventually come back because that training, all that you poured into them, all that you sat down and helped them to see the right way, eventually when their minds are mature enough or they made enough mistakes out there, they're going to come back because that training never goes nowhere. They can suppress it over yeah. time, but it, you know, eventually they'll always come back. Another question before I move on to your story. I know your parents played a major role in your life, especially, and we'll get to this, you know, when you got locked up, helping to raise your children. Your kids' fathers, mm-hmm. are they in the picture? Yeah, they're in the picture. And I actually have, I have two separate kid, uh, baby fathers. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. One is a CO, which like my son, to have had a mom in prison and a father as a CO. That was wow. like direct opposites. That was kind of crazy. And he was really a, a amazing father. And my other daughter's um, family is really good to her too. So I, I made two decent, you know, choices as far as fathers are concerned. So they definitely played their role. However, the Davises probably have had the greatest impact because my parents are just those hands-on parents and, you know, they just do what they do. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a regular job? Because I know before getting into real estate, you were in the credit. Yeah, I did. I used to work in the banks um, in the beginning of my life. Um, I actually forged working papers so I could get this job in the bank. So one of my first jobs was at EAB Bank as a vault representative. I went from that to a teller to a customer service representative um, pretty early in life, which is crazy that I later get convicted of bank fraud because I went in and I learned the whole system of how the bank works, how credit works, because that's when I started my own credit repair agency. But I learned really early on that I felt like a workplace for me was a prison because you had to be mandated there for a certain amount of hours, certain days you didn't want to go. And I didn't love what I do. I didn't get up every day loving what I I, I did. And as an entrepreneur, I could say I loved what I did. Like I enjoyed 
helping other people, doing my thing, working hard for me. So I just became an entrepreneur very early on in life. So um, my last real job, I think, was 18. And then after that, I became an entrepreneur. And it's so crazy that after that, now, I hadn't had another job since then until prison. And in prison, I was required to um, get a job inside the prison, unfortunately. But then fortunately, because I became the recreation clerk. So I had a high level prison position. And then recently after COVID hit and I wasn't sure about the checks, you know, that I was getting, I took on actually two jobs um, that I work on now, but I'm able to do them in a format where I don't feel, you know, Yep, 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 yep. These are like this is probably the first time social security taxes have come out. My I'm almost non existent in the social security uh, office because I never really ever had a job other than entrepreneurship. You know, I love that you're speaking because our audience is primarily entrepreneurs and people who just want to succeed, like really climb the corporate ladder and do their thing in business. And even as you're talking, it resonates so much with me because. I come up around the same time as you. And my grandfather and my family, they're from North Carolina. Interestingly enough, a small town you probably never heard of before. What is it called? In Burgo, of all places. Called what? Uh, Burgo, North Carolina. And I haven't, I'm surprised. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, it's the size of three city blocks. Okay, okay. What is it oh. next to? What's the main town that's next to that I wouldn't know? Wilmington. Okay. Wilmington, my, we didn't my have time. We the coast. Wilmington, so he would probably know Burgo. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I remember when, when I was coming up, I faced the same dilemma as you because all that was poured into me was, you know, the test for this is coming up or a real man. You, you, you get a state job or a city job. You work 30, 35 years and finally you can retire. And that's when you can live your life. You retire and then you die. Like, and, you know, like, exactly. That's the way I was looking at it. I'm like, yo, who's even say I'm going to make it that far? But everybody I see retiring, they, they dead two, three years after they retire. So it just didn't resonate with me. And it's interesting. And I'm so happy, even with the work that you're doing right now, you're showing our youth, you're showing this next generation. Yeah, you can hit the streets. Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship, it's a real thing. Yes. But if you use it wrong, you would hit the streets and be your own, you know, corner entrepreneur or, or moving weight, doing whatever you do. Or you could take that same skill set and put it into something legal. That's might right. take you a little longer to get to the finish line, but you're still an entrepreneur. But you're going to keep it. So that's the difference. And that's what I showed them. You can have millions. I was a multimillionaire at 25 years old. And every single thing I earned and worked hard, because I had to work hard for that too. Yep. Right? Yeah. It got taken away. So it was like, I never did it. Who wants to do that? Right. When you can work and keep what you earn and it just gets greater and greater and greater and greater. So I definitely, that's the lessons that I'm able to show people, not just tell them, right. It's one thing to tell somebody something, but it's another thing to give them an actual factual, you know, result. Like this is what happened to me. So when they hear it from that standpoint, they'd be like, you know what, Miss Davis, you're right. You know, it, 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 the Bible says, it, and people get this, this Bible verse wrong all the time. It, people typically quote, money is the root of all evil. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible, the Bible says the, the love, love of money, for the love of it. Yeah. And in your case, I got to, you, you're a multimillionaire by 25 years old. Kudos to you. Like, like, really think about how gifted you are to make that kind of money, to seize the opportunities in front of you and do what you did. And then it all comes crumbling down. Can you speak to anybody right now who is on this path and they have a love of money, not a love of entrepreneurship, not a love of going out and doing something that can enhance the world, change somebody's life, but they're just chasing the money because I believe that's the downfall. That's where it all comes crumbling down is the love of it. It's not. I think that it's helping them. Okay. So it's mindset shift, right? Mm -hmm. Those people that have a love of money, why? Right. 
It could have been this, generally some kind of insecurity in that particular person, right? Because you should love yourself more than anything, right? And you should love yourself more than money. Because if you love yourself more than money, then you won't compromise your integrity to get money. You will let money chase you rather than you chase the money. So it starts with mindset shift, right? Why do you love money so much? What do you feel like that it's covering up or giving you that you haven't given to yourself? So it's doing that inner work, right? And you to figure out how, what, what are my morals? What are my values? What am I setting? What am I putting in the atmosphere? And it's nothing to like, um, it's nothing wrong with li liking nice things. I love nice things and I'm always going to continue to have nice things because I think that we were born to be kings and queens on this planet. However, I am not willing to risk my freedom. I'm not willing to risk my integrity, my morals, my values, or any of those things for money. It's the exact opposite. As I set the tone, as I dictate what it's going to be or how it's going to move, that's how the atmosphere and the universe is going to open up to me to give me more of what I'm looking for. So I feel like it's a mindset shift. It's about uh, figuring out why control. do you lust and love money so much? What is it? And what are you missing inside of you that you're using money to replace? What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.